Bull's Viper is not only a highly venomous snake, it's also extremely adaptable and very widely distributed. It's found not only in the paddy fields behind me, but it's also found in the forest, in the woodlands, and in the grasslands, to altitudes of 5,000 feet, which is 10 times the height that I am now. The sand is very, very fine. This is to prevent the ant, once it's fallen in, clambering back out again. They struggle and struggle, and they find it very difficult. And even if the ant managed to get part the way up, the ant lion will bring it back down again by flicking sand at it till it knocks it back down. Once an ant has fallen into an ant lion den, it is history. This is a tiny predator of single ants. But of course, the sloth bear is a large predator. It will raid ant nests and termite nests and bees nests. And it's perfectly designed to do this. This carving is completely new to science. Anslam's research has uncovered local stories of herdsmen encountering a ferocious Russell's viper here. He believes this carving marked the incident and the city was named after the snake, Polonarua. In Sinhalese, Polon from Polonga means viper and Narua translates as vicious, vicious viper. This is an efficient predator come scavenger. The larger animal, and it's not even fully grown, is trying to swallow this goat in the same way a python would, head first, so that the limbs fold down beside it, and it's hoping to get the whole meal down, while the other two are ripping pieces off. This is butchery at its most basic. These dragons eat in exactly the way you were told not to when you were a child. The whole essence of a crocodile, its natural history, is stealth, whether hunting or hiding. They don't submerge forwards. That creates a wake. If you watch a crocodile when it goes under, it drops backwards before going forwards. They barely create a ripple. And you could even have a large croc cruising along just under the surface and never even see it. How these crocodiles got here in the first place might be revealed by the landscape. The Sahara is scoured with remains of ancient waterways and boreholes like this, which have been created where water swirls a hard rock deep down cutting into the bedrock. They're all sure signs that this was once a raging torrent. Mark hopes to find his first sign of the anacondas. This is a skin of a boa constrictor. Head and legs of a green iguana. This jar says Habo de Jiboa, which is boa constrictor tail. In actual fact, this should say Habo de Sukari, because this is an anaconda tail. It's people walking home at dusk from the paddy fields or working in the paddy fields, treading on or picking up concealed snakes and it's particularly during the agricultural seasons because that's when people are out in large numbers. Venom should be obtained from Sri Lankan snakes mm. and used to raise a special Sri Lankan anti-venom. Yeah. And crucially, it's going to involve people like you, Mark, who know about snakes because we need that venom. It's nearly a year since Anak last blew, so worryingly, the next explosion is due any time. How much warning are you liable to get if it's going to erupt? Well, can you get off? Yeah, sometimes it, it shakes and rumbles a little bit and you've got five minutes to run off. Five minutes? Maybe. Sometimes it just goes off with no warning at all. All of a sudden there's rocks flying out the top and if that happened you'd be in real trouble. If I turn them, the blood is still liquid, whereas the right hand where the venom has gone into the blood is one large blood clot. Now this is what would happen when the snake strikes its rodent prey. Within a very, very short time, all of the blood in the rodent will clot and it will die. The snake will track it down.
and eat it. But what would happen if this amount of venom was injected into a human is somewhat different. Initially, it would cause clotting, but the body would break down the clots and continue to do so until there was no clotting agent left in the blood. What would happen then is you would have blood that couldn't clot. You would bleed from the site of the bite. You would bleed from old scars. You would bleed possibly from the gums. And because the venom also contains a component that causes hemorrhaging, puts holes in the blood vessels, you would bleed from the blood vessels. If this happens, you could bleed to death. A theory about this, um, the worst species of crocodile in North Africa that are extinct now. Now, who's to say that this isn't um, a relic population of one of those extinct species and not really a Nile crocodile at all? So it would be very interesting to first measure them, mark them, um, getting DNA samples. But the problem is we have to catch them. We have to catch them. First, we have to get there. It's a journey of danger and endurance, and it looks like we're stuck here for the night. It's been eight arduous days on the river, but we all feel elated with the results. We've confirmed not one, but two locations used by one of the world's rarest crocodiles. Yozapong is close to identifying purebred Siamese crocs in the commercial farms. One day, he hopes they will finally go back where they belong. Oh, I yeah. And living in there, there's plenty of toads. And cobras do eat toads. They'll eat other snakes. And of course, they'll eat rats. So he got everything going for him here. Come out, bask in the sun, go in, have a snack, go to bed. Perfect. But the point is, there's people living all around here. And he's a fairly unpopular house guest. We've got a cobra for our hearing test. He'd been hit, I think, by a vehicle and had got blood all over him. I've nursed him overnight. And as you can see, he's hot to trot. They go away like trains. <laughs>